Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Phelps, the senior pastor of Colonial Hills Baptist Church, Indianapolis, Indiana. Now in its 63rd year, Colonial Hills enjoys a wonderful heritage of connecting souls to the Savior through the careful preaching of God's Word. I'm Colonial's third senior pastor. Pastor Wendell Heller, our founding pastor, and Pastor Bob Taylor, our pastor emeritus, are still part of Colonial Hills Baptist Church. God has blessed our church with a legacy of Bible-based unity. So welcome. We trust that today's service will meet a need in your life and be a blessing to you. This morning's message is entitled, Escaping the Stronghold of Economic Insecurity. As we continue to discover how to pull down spiritual strongholds like grief and doubt and fear and loneliness, our Pulling Down Stronghold series is available on our live stream or through sermon audio. All of us face spiritual strongholds. A stronghold is an impediment to our spiritual progress. The stronghold that frustrates your faith may differ from the stronghold which frustrates mine. All of us can claim the promise of 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, which says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of the flesh, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We're opening our Bibles today to the 37th Psalm, Psalm 37. You'll want to open there with me. I'm praying that the Lord will use today's message to help you face a stronghold which is growing larger every day as we live through the pandemic of 2020. Let's read from Psalm 37, verse 25. Here's the testimony of David. He says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Can you say the verse with me? I have been young, now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Let's ask the Lord to bless as we learn how to escape the stronghold of economic insecurity. Let's pray together. Father, I pray you'd use this message to impact some life for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might lift up a banner in a confused land with the clarity of your word, we might know your doings in our days. And Lord, if there's someone who's watching today who needs to come to Christ as Savior, may be, this be the day that they turn to him whom to know is life everlasting. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Early reports indicated that America experienced its first coronavirus death on the 29th of February, 2020. On the 12th of February, 2020, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was riding its longest bull market in history, hitting an all-time high of 29,551 points. Unemployment in the United States was at an all-time low, 3.5% when news came of the first coronavirus death. In early February, Americans were enjoying an almost unimaginable time of prosperity. Then came the COVID-19 shutdown and consequent financial meltdown. In just days, the market lost over 20% of its value. According to an article published on the 23rd of February by Fortune magazine, over 26.5 million jobs have been lost in America due to the coronavirus. Today, our national jobless rate is above 20%. Americans now face a time of unimaginable economic insecurity. These events should not surprise Bible-believing Christians. Proverbs 23.5 says, Riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away, even as an eagle toward the heaven. I'd like to ask you a question today. Are you struggling with economic insecurity? Many people are. So today I'm asking the Lord to help us all escape our financial strongholds. Let me suggest that in order to escape, you must see the economic problem. It's quite natural for us to want to hide our heads in the sand and pretend that our financial problems will go away. In truth, this is how Americans face many of their financial challenges. When the corona crisis came to America, the First National Bank of Omaha, Nebraska reported that 49% of American adults were living paycheck to paycheck, and 53% of Americans have no emergency fund. Studies indicate that as many as one half of the American population will come to the age of retirement with no savings at all. Once again, 
Bible-believing Christians should not be surprised. After all, God's Word is not welcome in our schools or in our marketplaces. Americans simply do not know that Proverbs 6 advises all of us to study the ant in order to learn how to be industrious and save for the future. Those who find themselves enslaved in the stronghold of economic insecurity often fail to see the problem. They are unaware of the problems caused by personal debt. Many Americans are drowning in debt. Today, Americans owe 50 more, 52 percent more than they did just a decade ago. American credit card owners owe on average $7,697. Students who borrowed to receive their education owe on average $32,731. Consumer debt in America is higher than it's ever been. It now stands at $13.86 trillion. Personal debt strangles the young and the not so young. Christians need to be aware that easy credit can easily lead to a great crisis. Proverbs 22 7 warns that the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. That's why the Savior told his disciples to count the cost. Unfortunately, the debt trap is easy to fall into when we live in a country led by politicians who seem to think nothing of plunging our nation into more and more debt. Sadly, they seem unaware of the problems caused by national debt. It seems like every election cycle, our national leaders demonstrate great concern about our country's debt. <laughs> then, when they get into office, they cast their vote to raise the debt ceiling. Today, America owes nearly $46 trillion in so-called unfunded obligations like Medicare and Social Security. America's national debt now amounts to almost $70,000 per person. Economists warn that the coronavirus stimulus package, which recently passed by a near unanimous vote of our Congress, will lead to dangerous hyperinflation. The economic problems we face in America are not ours alone. Yet when we look at the economic situation as assessed by leaders around the world, it appears that they're unaware of the problems caused by global debt. The global pandemic of the coronavirus has brought with it a global pandemic of debt. On the 15th of April, the Wall Street Journal reported, governments around the world will amass huge debts to combat the coronavirus, which could pose risk once the threat of the pandemic fades. Just this past Wednesday, the International Monetary Fund reported that global authorities have announced emergency efforts totaling almost $8 trillion in deficit spending, loans, and loan guarantees. That's roughly 9.5% of global output. According to Victor Gaspar, the International Monetary Fund's fiscal affairs director, the enormity of our current economic crisis is prompting some to call for radical solutions. Yale Global Online recently recommended that world leaders need to consider a world currency. Naturally, this all leads to a desire for a one world government. And quite predictably, the online journal entitled The Week published an article on the 1st of April entitled coronavirus and the case for a one-world government. Such a desire is not something new. Listen to the message that President Jimmy Carter placed inside Voyager 1 and 2 way back in 1977. President Carter actually said, and I quote, this Voyager spacecraft was constructed by the United States of America, a community of 240 million human beings among the more than 4 billion who inhabit the planet Earth, still divided into nation states, but rapidly becoming a single global civilization. We cast this message to the cosmos, said Jimmy Carter, a present from a small distant world. We hope someday, having solved the problems that we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. As the clamor for world currency and world government grows, 
those who would escape the stronghold of economic insecurity know the economic security that is prophesied. You need to know the economic prophecy that's found in God's Word. Turn with me, please, to the book of James. The book of James. You'll find the book of James located near the end of the New Testament, right after the book of Hebrews. The Bible clearly presents a coming economic crisis of global, catastrophic proportions. James speaks of this crisis in chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, when he says, Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. James speaks with prophetic certainty of a calamitous day in which the unbelieving rich will weep and howl as they see their assets destroyed. The book of the Revelation also speaks of a coming economic apocalypse. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of the Revelation, the sixth chapter, Revelation 6. Here we meet the four horsemen of the tribulation. Now look quickly with me at how John describes the third horseman. In Revelation 6, 5, we read, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Then in verse 6 we read, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine. John sees a time of future economic peril and famine. The rider on the black horse holds a scale which is used to measure commodities. A voice declares, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. The silver coin, designated here as a penny, is actually a Roman coin called a denarius. In the wage scale of New Testament times, it was common for a person to receive a denarius for an entire day's work. So, John is saying, a person will need to work all day to purchase one measure of wheat or three measures of barley. A measure was approximately the amount of grain a working person would need to survive for one day. This passage says that a person would work all day for enough wheat to survive one more day or enough cheap barley for three days. There'd be no money left over to purchase wine or oil. John sees a total economic collapse on the horizon. And more than that, the book of the Revelation predicts a total upending of the food chain that is now sustaining the world. A day is coming when staple commodities will become virtually unaffordable. Let's turn to Revelation 13 in order to discover how society, led by Antichrist and his false prophet, will seek to solve the coming economic collapse. Notice with me that in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18, we read, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understandeth count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, threescore, and six. In order to solve the coming economic collapse, Everyone on earth is to receive a mark of personal identification which provides the right to purchase. No mark, no buying or selling. Imagine, no more credit card fraud. A cashless society. All you'll need is the right tattoo or an embedded microchip. In an article for Simplemost magazine published on the 30th of May in 2018, Emily Hanford Osman asked, Have you ever lost your keys or your credit card? The key card you desperately need to get into your office building? Of course you have. So she says, Think long and hard about this next question. 
Would you trade out all those items for a tiny microchip and plant it into your skin? The article continues, here's another idea. Imagine all of the smart devices you wear and the information they collect being stored in that same microchip. As futuristic as it sounds, she continues, there are already thousands of people using microchips injected into their skin to replace things like credit cards, keys, an ID, and in some cases, train tickets. They're being used around the world, including in the United States. Naturally, implementing a worldwide cashless society will require a one-world government, led, of course, by a single one-world leader. And Revelation 13 predicts that there will indeed be a one-world government and a one-world leader. Revelation 13.1 introduces us to someone called a beast. In Revelation 13.7, we discover that the beast has power, watch it, over all kindreds, all tongues, all nations. In other words, he's a world leader over a worldwide economy. Way back in 1994, financier David Rockefeller addressed the United Nations. Listen to what he said. He said, quote, all we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. Wow. Henry Spock, who was one of the early planners of the European common market once said, we do not want another committee. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift, lift us up out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. Can I ask a question today? Could the coronavirus be the crisis that tips the world into a cashless society led by a worldwide government and a one world leader. The economies of the world are at their breaking point. America is not the only country whose economy is in peril. COVID-19 has hit well over 100 countries, breaking the banks around the world. I'd suggest that our world is filled with people today who have become desensitized by a crisis and would be very willing to wear another tattoo or embed a small chip under their skin if they knew that such a decision would help them meet their medical and financial needs, that their governments would know where to send the money. Now listen carefully. According to the prophecies of the Bible, the new world order under a one world leader with a global economy is going to happen. But those things will not happen until the unique presence of the Holy Spirit who is in the church, is taken out of the world. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 promises that the Holy Spirit will continue to restrain until he's taken out of the way. I believe that this will happen at the rapture. After the Holy Spirit's unique presence is gone and the church is raptured, the Antichrist is going to be revealed. The surest way to avoid the tribulation that the Bible prophesies and the temptation to receive the mark of the beast that is surely coming is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. The church of the Lord Jesus awaits the rapture, and after the rapture comes the tribulation. In the meantime, let me ask, do you have an economic plan? Do you have an economic plan? In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 12, Solomon observes, of making many books, there is no end. Solomon's observation is certainly true with regard to the making of books about how to manage money. Let me suggest that there is one money management manual that's far better than anything else that's ever been written or ever will be written. Since you have access to the Bible, you have access to the wisdom of God for your salvation and for your financial success. Now, I'm not presumptuous enough to offer financial advice, but I'm confident that a biblical strategy of money management will give you everything that you need to pull down the stronghold of economic insecurity. Did you know that 2,350 verses in the Bible relate to the matter of money, and that there are at least 126 financial principles on matters of money to be found 
in the New Testament alone. So we'll not be able to cover all that's found in God's word on the subject of finance today. Let me provide you with just a few principles. Principles to ponder in order to put together a Bible-based financial plan. You ready? First, be content. Nothing will lead to financial failure and frustration faster than discontent and greed. Marketers know that to sell is easy when selling to the malcontent. Discontentment drives the marketplace and often leads to financial disaster. We find God's command for all of us in Hebrews 13, 5, which says, Let your conversation or your lifestyle be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Contentment is simply believing that God has provided everything that I need for my present happiness. Be content. Then, save something. Save something. Proverbs 21.20 says, There's treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. Do you have a plan to put aside part of your income? You should. Now, I'm not saying you need to be a miser, but the Bible says you should be a saver. Remember, if you spend less than you make long enough, you'll be a financial success. Then remember too, avoid debt. Avoid debt. Proverbs 22, seven says, the borrower is servant to the lender. The Bible does not forbid indebtedness, but certainly presents principles that encourage caution. Those who are wise often advise, borrow to own an item that will appreciate in value, but pay cash for the things that depreciate. Many will say, Borrowing to buy my house is the best financial decision I ever made. While others are saying, making purchases with my credit card ruined me. So finally, learn to give generously. Acts 20 verse 35 encourages all of us to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Begin by giving to God's work. Make that your first priority. Proverbs 3 Verses 9 and 10 provides both instruction and a promise when it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I'm not preaching prosperity theology, but I do believe that a biblical theology of giving will bring prosperity. So give generously to God's work in order to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt and thieves are not able to break through and steal. By now, some are probably saying, Pastor, you make it sound like it's easy to break free out of the stronghold of economic insecurity. Well, maybe you didn't hear me. I just said that the Bible teaches us to be content, to save, to avoid debt, and to give generously. Doing these things is not easy. In fact, I believe that apart from the power of Christ in your life, you'll probably find it impossible to maintain your financial commitments. But those who know Christ can say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Perhaps you're asking, is that all there is to it? Is that how the stronghold of insecurity is escaped? No, that's not all. I saved the most important point for last. You see, if you would pull down the stronghold of economic insecurity, you will need to trust God's economic promise. You need to trust God's economic promise. Many people trust in their riches and come to ruin. That's why James offers a stiff warning in James 5:17 when he says, "Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches." but of the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. History has proved that bank accounts and land holdings and stock portfolios can vanish in nanoseconds. Just ask Job. And while the Lord never says it's a sin to be rich, 
he does say that it's a sin to put your trust in your wealth. You need to put your trust in God. God never fails. David, the shepherd king, testified of God's ability to provide for his people. When in Psalm 37, 4, David says, I've been young, now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Paul suffered awful persecution. Yet he wrote his letter to Philippians from a Roman prison and said in Philippians 4 and verse 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. Jesus told us, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. When we suffer from economic insecurity, it's because our faith is small. Turn with me to Romans 8. In order to strengthen your faith, I draw your attention to Romans 8. It's a favorite chapter for many of God's people. In this chapter, we find comforting eternal truth. I want to ask you to look carefully at Romans 8, verse 32. Here we read, He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Since God gave Jesus Christ to die for our sins, to grant us forgiveness and give us a home in heaven, we can certainly trust him to provide for us in uncertain times. Have you placed your trust in Jesus? Have you accepted the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and a home in heaven that he died to provide for you? Salvation is not something that you can earn. The Bible says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can have salvation today if you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he is God who became man. Believe that he died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. Believe that he was buried and rose again the third day. Believe that if you call on him by faith, he'll hear you and give you everlasting life. Believe today. The choice could not be clearer. Trust in Christ, who can give you all things richly to enjoy, or trust in yourself and the economic insecurity offered by a crumbling culture. Listen, you can trust in God's economic promise. The God who provided for Adam in the garden and never forgot to send manna to feed Israel in the wilderness will not forget to provide for you. The Savior who fed the 5,000 with just a few loaves and fishes is able to multiply his mercies toward you and toward your family. The Holy Spirit, who is ever with us, never stops making intercession for us. As the financial instability of our times ensnares more and more victims, God is calling upon us to escape from the stronghold of economic insecurity. For many years, I preached every other week in a retirement village. From time to time, I'd ask the residents what they wanted to sing as we gathered together. Invariably, someone would ask, that we sing, God will take care of you. Do you know why they like the song, God will take care of you? It's because God will take care of you. So be not dismayed, whate'er betide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. In just a moment, Pastor Greg is going to be sharing a few words with all of us who have gathered today, a few words of encouragement. But before he comes to share those words with you today, perhaps I can encourage you. If you've not already received Christ as Savior, you can do that today. Simply cry out from a heart of sincerity, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And the word of God says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And Christian, if you're suffering from economic insecurity, may God help you to lay hold on the promises of his word and follow his plan and know the blessing of his security today. May God bless you.